Well, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see you again. I think I know most of the people in the group uh, from the boat training and things like that over the years. But uh, what this class is is basically just an awareness level training class for response to swift water situations. And basically, this, this process came about because Vincennes University wanted to reach out to first responders to find out what kind of training that they thought was important. And the reason we started out with this one was because basically real simple, I went to a District 10 meeting in the Evansville area and I asked the people in attendance there what kind of class that they needed the worst, that they needed the most training in. And believe it or not, Swift Water Rescue was the thing that they told me. Most of the agencies there are uh, volunteer fire departments, so they may not have the opportunity to get some uh, the training opportunities that you guys have. So that's why we put this class together and uh, a little bit about what the future may hold is we're working on a partnership with DHS right now where this class will have a certification with it. When we can get that worked out in the future, it's basically going to be a partnership between Vincennes and, and Homeland Security that uh, we will deliver some classes and hopefully get their, their blessing and their certification for it. So if and when that happens, I'll get down here and I'll make sure that uh, we can retroactively get you guys uh, that certification for what we've gone through. I don't have a time frame, but I've been assured that is in the, in the future. I think the reason that most of the responders picked this course is because scenes like that right there uh, are very prevalent. I know you guys have witnessed things like that along the Ohio River all too often. And it's one of the most devastating, expensive natural disasters that our country has to face every year. Basically, this is an awareness level training class. We're not going to get in the water. But what we want to do is teach you some of the things, even if you are not a person that's going to get in the water and try to make a rescue, you're still going to have a very active part from the shoreline. We want to teach you some of those tactics and also despite our best efforts, we know that sometimes first responders end up in the water when they don't intend to and we want to teach you some things, some techniques that if you go in the swift water that it's going to keep you alive. We want, to, we want you to have a basic understanding of how you're going to get out. The class is split into the modules that we think are going to be most beneficial for you. Basically, we want you to be able to read the river. We want you to look at different characteristics of that moving water, know what the name of it is, and know what it does, and know what effect that's going to have on you if you do go in the water or if you're doing a rescue for somebody that is in the water, some of the characteristics of how that's going to affect that victim, how to make that rescue. I want to teach you some of the things to take into consideration when you're getting ready to make that response, some risk management. I want to talk about some of the gear. Certain gear is not survival gear, rescue gear is not the best suited for some types of rescue. So we want to talk a little bit about maybe some of the equipment that would be best for you if you get into that situation. And if you don't remember anything else that we talk about today, I want you to remember the module on self-rescue because that's what you will do if you get swept away or if you get in swift water, even though you don't intend it. This is how, this, this is the technique that you're going to use to get out. I want to talk to you a little bit about cold water, how that's going to affect your rescue efforts. You know, what happens when somebody goes in cold water, some of the effects. We want to talk about some things that, where you can make a rescue uh, from the shoreline. 
some of the devices and some of the techniques that you may be able to use that will help you make that rescue without getting in the water. And we also want to talk a little bit about low head dams. That's something that's very, very prevalent in Indiana. And they are called killing machine by first responders. And there's a reason for that because a lot of first responders have lost their lives attempting to make rescues at low head dams. And I can tell you Clark County has a lot of low head dams. They may not be in your jurisdiction, but it would not be very uncommon whatsoever for you guys to get called to assist another agency during flood time if uh, they have to make a rescue. So we want to talk about the dynamics of some of that moving water and what the hazards are and some techniques that you might use to get someone out of the water. Again, this is an awareness level class, but I would encourage each one of you, if you have the desire, if you want to learn more about swift water rescue, uh, years ago I was able to go to the Indiana River Rescue School at South Bend, and I can tell you in 31 years of public service, that was probably one of the best schools, the best training that I ever received. Uh, the facility that they have, the people that they have teaching. The facility is absolutely second to none because they can divert water all off of uh, the St. Joe River into the East Race and uh, they can create pretty much every kind of water characteristic that you're going to encounter. Uh, you'll learn a lot of boat operation skills. It's a great class if you get that opportunity. I would highly encourage it. One of the things that really blew my mind when I started researching this is the number of drownings. You know, drownings are preventable. You know, if, it's, if you can predict it, you can prevent it. But there's an average of 10 to 12 drownings in the United States every single day. That blew my mind. I couldn't believe that. These statistics, by the way, are from the Center for Disease Control. So you would have to think that they're pretty accurate. But in the United States, there's an average of over 3,500 drownings a year. Those are unintentional drownings. They, do not, they don't include suicides, people that jump in the water to drown themselves. Does not include boating accidents. And you'll notice that in Indiana, for last year, we were well above the curve because we had 114 accidental drownings just in the state of Indiana. Those statistics were from uh, uh, Indiana DNR, the information that they compiled. And all too often, and one of the reasons that we're here today, is first responders responding to those water-related calls end up being some of the victims. And that is the purpose of these classes, to try to prevent that from happening. When you get a lot of water, a lot of rainfall, basically that flooding occurs in four stages. The first stage, that water is going to start to rise. You're going to notice that the current in the river is going to start to increase. You'll notice the current will increase before the water level starts to rise. But then when the water starts to rise, it will rise until it crests, which is the second phase. It will hit its highest level. But in between one and two, that's when all of those lower lying areas that you guys have to respond to, that's when those areas are going to flood. And that's when that moving water is going to be coming into your neighborhoods. It's going to be flowing in. Then when it hits the crest, it's going to be flowing out. So there's really never a time that that water is not moving in or out when it's in flood stage. And that's when you guys are in jeopardy when you are responding to rescues and evacuations during those phases because I don't care how many advertisements that you have on TV or how many times they show it on the news I guarantee you that every time you have streets flooded that you will have people that drive around your barricades and their car drowns out in the water and you guys have to go get them right or wrong I can tell you that because it was the same th thing for me the job that I did for 31 years, 
every single year we were making rescues and people off the top of uh, vehicles that went around barricades. I guess uh, that's human nature. It's not going to change. It's just something that, that's why we have a job, I guess. But the fourth phase is recovery. And you guys, I know, can probably already tell me that uh, flooding is one of the most expensive natural disasters that we encounter in the United States. Just last year, you saw on TV the effects that it had on Houston and in Florida. The effects of high water are absolutely devastating. Two things that most people, including first responders, that they underestimate, that's the power of moving water and the effects that cold water has on your body when you get it when you are in the water. Those two things are grossly underestimated. A cubic foot of water moving at four miles an hour. And to give you a little perspective, if you can walk a 15 minute mile, which I guarantee you everybody in here can, that gives you an idea of what four miles an hour is. If you can walk a 15 minute mile, then you are walking at four miles an hour. During the summer months in the Midwest and this part of the country, the normal flow of water is two to four miles an hour. When we have a flood where we encounter flash floods where neighborhoods are flooded, that will increase to eight to 12 miles an hour. Now that doesn't sound like much, but a cubic foot of water moving at four miles an hour past a given point will exert 66 pounds of pressure. As that doubles, when it goes from four miles an hour to eight miles an hour, that energy and that power doesn't double, it quadruples. So you're dealing with over 200 pounds of pressure on any given point that that water is pushing against. And as that velocity of water, the speed of that water goes up, that energy goes up exponentially. So it carries incredible power with it. Let there be no doubt in your mind, somebody that drives across moving water that is moving at such a velocity, one foot of moving water can move a vehicle. If it's moving fast enough, it can push a vehicle off the road. some of those terms and characteristics that, that we want you to know and understand. When you have flood water, and you guys have probably noticed this, when the Ohio River is flooded, you can look out in the river and it looks like there is one section of that river where it's moving so much faster than the other. It almost looks like a river in the river. That's referred to as the laminar flow. That is the fastest section of that moving water. As you go out to each side of that area, the velocity or speed of that water slows down. And as you go deeper, if you could slice that river, as you get underneath that fastest surface part, that current starts to slow. It's that part in the very center on the surface that is the fastest flow of water. As you get to the shoreline, there's going to be kind of a turnover in that current. That's called the helical flow. And the reason when you see high water, when the water river starts to come up, you'll notice that debris is taken off the shoreline and it always goes to the middle of the river. That's because of that helical flow and that turnover. And that's why as it starts to slow, then it'll be deposited downstream along the shoreline again. But that turnover is what undercuts the shoreline, and that's what sweeps that debris off the, uh, off the banks of the river. The way that you describe your position on the water is always from the perspective of looking downstream. River right or river left, is always determined from you looking downstream. 
Eddie, very, very important for you to know and be able to recognize what that is. An eddy is created by some kind of obstacle in the water. You'll notice the bigger that obstacle and the swifter the water, the more the water piles up on the upstream side. That creates a backflow directly behind that object. Difficult to tell from photographs, but this area here, the water is actually flowing back to fill that hole created by that obstacle. These areas right here, you see that white water? That area right there, those lines are referred to as an eddy line. If you get swept away in the water, and you can't get yourself immediately out of the water, an eddy, if you can find an eddy, that is a place, if you can get your body into that, that you can rest and you will be out of that strong current. You notice this guy on a surfboard, he's pulling into that eddy, and that current coming back against that obstacle will hold him right there. That's a place that you can get out of that current. Now how you do that? As you are coming downstream, we'll talk about your body positioning and all that thing, those things later, but you want to get yourself as close to this eddy line as you can. And as you get there, you want to flip over on your belly and swim in the direction to that obstacle do your best Michael Phelps impression and get yourself behind that obstacle and that current will hold you there, that backflow, while you rest or while somebody gets to you to rescue you. Very important that you're able to recognize what an eddy is though. An eddy doesn't have to be caused by an obstacle in the water. It can actually be caused by a land formation as well. If you've got a bend in the river or if you've got a point, a land point that comes out, what it's going to do is divert all the water this way. And what's going to happen is this water here is going to be a lot slower and it's going to recirculate because the water, the current, diverts everything here. So it's going to be coming out this way, hitting this hitting this faster current, but there's going to be a, a slow recirculation right there. Much slower water if you can get yourself into that area. Strainer. Remember that term. It's one of the most dangerous things that you will encounter if you go in the water. A strainer is anything that will let water pass through it, but not a solid object. If you're doing a rescue in a neighborhood and you've, you're, you're going door to door and you've got swift moving water, a fence, a chain link fence can be a strainer because it's going to let water pass through it. Uh, a wrought iron gate around someone's property can be a strainer because it will pin you against it, but the water will go through. Most commonly what you're going to see is something like this. It's going to be debris and brush and logs that create that strainer. But it doesn't matter whether you are in a boat or whether you accidentally fall in. You want to avoid those at all costs if you can. Very, very dangerous. The force of that water will literally pin you against it. You know, we talked about the, what a cubic foot of water will do. Uh, if you get your body pinned against that strainer, going to be very, very difficult for you to get a loose. Upstream V's and downstream V's. That's determined by the apex or the point of that V. Upstream V's where the point is pointed toward you, those are bad because that's indicating that there is an obstacle in front of you that is diverting that water in a V. If you have an, a downstream V where you're looking at the open end, 
That's telling you that there is an obstacle on each side, but it's safe for you to go in the middle. Okay? Downstream Vs are good. That's the area that you want your body or your boat to go because that's an area between two obstacles. Pillow is caused by water going over an object. If you have a boulder in the water or whatever the case may be, maybe something in a neighborhood that's a solid object, if you see the water is elevated higher than everything else and it's flowing over something, that's going to tell you that there is an object, solid object, stationary object that the water is going over. You want to avoid that. A hole is basically created. That's on the downstream side where the water's flowing over. It's going to create an indention. Standing waves. This is a very good example here of what I was talking about, a downstream V. You've got an obstacle here, an obstacle here, and you notice that white or aerated water. You can't see the apex, but you can see it's a V and you see the rescuer is shooting the gap between those obstacles. Standing waves are normally found where you have an incline where you've got water going down and it's going to be going down much faster than when it levels off and that water is going to pile up on itself that's going to create a standing wave. Hydraulic another very very deadly situation that's caused where water drops over an object and it drops over with such force that that water drives itself to the bottom then when it comes up it creates a boil area and the problem is on the back side it constantly recirculates. This is a term that's normally uh, thought of when it, in association with low head dams but it doesn't have to be. Any time that you have water dropping over something into a lower area the more water that is coming over, the bigger that hydraulic is going to be. Very easy for someone to get stuck in that hydraulic. A lot of first responders have lost their lives trying to make rescues in the hydraulics of low head dams and uh, other areas where those are created. give you an example here of uh, what that looks like. Notice this guy here.
So that's a hydraulic. That's exactly the way it works. And I'll tell you guys, that wasn't a very big one. But you can see not one, not two, but three people got caught. The second two were trying to get the first one out. So three people got caught in a very small hydraulic. And the one thing that I pointed out, the guy on the repel line, no PFD, how smart is that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, why do some of these type of rescues fail? Unlike you guys, you guys are very blessed in that you have a lot of training opportunities that a lot of other agencies don't have statewide. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, but they have to respond to incidents like we just saw. And something that is very common, and I'll give you an example, uh, we all think we're invincible. We think nothing can happen to us. And we overestimate our ability, especially in that kind of current and in cold water. Because it's uh, moving water, the force of that, and especially when it's cold, it's very devastating on our bodies. And we have a very limited time before we start losing dexterity. We start losing use of some of our uh, muscle groups. I'll give you an example of someone overestimating their ability. In the Cordon area on Indian Creek, there's a series of low head dams before you get into the city of Cordon. And uh, when I was still working, I was a district commander, and I got a call that there were two victims that were caught in the recirculation, like you just saw, of a low head dam, and they were deceased. Two teenage girls. When I got there, one had already been kicked out and had been recovered. But the second victim was still recirculating. I was actually approached by another law enforcement officer who told me, I'm a great swimmer. I can go in there and get that victim. If any of you guys have any training or experience with swift water, you would know how totally ludicrous that statement is. And I literally, as the incident commander at that scene, basically had to tell that guy to shut up and get back to his car. He didn't work for me, but he was a law enforcement officer. I'll tell you that much. I could tell you the name and all you guys would know it, but I'm not going to. But Come on. that's a perfect, you would know who it was, I guarantee you. But, uh, State, but that's, that's irrelevant. But the simple fact is, we do overestimate our abilities because there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that if I had let that guy get in the water, we would have been pulling two deceased victims out, not one. A lot of times we will go to scenes where the most that we can do is recover somebody that's already deceased, but we are all in the business. We're here because we want to help people. We want to save people. And so sometimes we have a tendency of thinking with our heart, with compassion, instead of our experience in our brain. Always, always, when you make those decisions, think about risk versus gain. You know, don't, uh, a perfect example of the feeling of urgency to act. I had a video, some of you have probably seen it, of the Coast Guard in Canada. They were responding to a dead victim in the surf. Terrible, terrible water conditions. Should not have, no one should have been out there in a boat. But it was close to this guy's town. The media was there. The family was there. And they are all urging these people to go out and make that recovery. So they do. They go out. Ends up they get in a bind in their boat. The boat pitch poles, which means it capsizes end over end, throws all the rescuers out of the boat. They're all killed. And we went from one victim in a recovery to four victims. Three of them were rescuers. 
Canadian Coast Guard, that died because they let outside people influence their common sense. So those are things that we need to keep in mind when we're deciding how we're going to respond to these swift water incidents. And again, like I said earlier, the two things that even first responders, the two things that they drastically underestimate is the effects that cold water will have on their bodies and they underestimate the power of that moving water. And just like the guy on the rappel line, he rappel line over a hydraulic where people are trapped with no PFD on. So it doesn't, it's not just spectators sometimes that fail to wear the proper gear, you know, that fail to take the proper precaution. A lot of first responders have lost their life responding to swift water incidents. Uh, because of things just like that. They are in such a hurry to react and to, to take some kind of action that they don't think about the ramifications of what they're doing. The way to prevent that is situational awareness. When you respond, always have a good understanding of those things. Don't just get tunnel vision and focus on a victim and getting that victim out of the water because there's a lot of things taking place around you. A lot of debris and moving water, right? Always have somebody focusing upstream that can let you know if there's debris or something headed toward you. That's going to affect your ability to make that rescue always have secondary rescuers downstream that can deploy a throw bag if for some reason you get washed out of a boat or you get washed downstream you want somebody down there that can get you a line and get you out of water so always see the big picture don't just think about one thing uh, think about everything that can happen and have that have those risk in your mind Risk assessment is one of the most important things that you can do when you're responding to, I know you do this on the other calls that you're making now, but it's just as important in swift water rescue or responding to evacuations or whatever you might do associated with swift water. Keep in mind the water temperature. You know, if you get someone wet, you're gonna have to get them warmed up. Uh, if you respond and it's really hot, you guys know this better than anybody. You got to have a lot of fluid uh, to keep yourself from dehydrating. So those are kinds of risk assessments that I know you guys do every day on every call that you make. A tool that was created by the United States Coast Guard that all of their units use before they make any responses, it's called a GAR. That, st that stands for green, amber, red. And what they do is they assess six different areas. Basically those areas are planning, crew selection, crew fitness, environment, and event complexity. Each one of those categories is given a number from one to ten. And everyone in that crew has the ability to respond what they think that should be. Basically, one means there's very little risk. Ten means it's extremely high risk. But to break those categories down for you, basically, uh, supervision. You know, if we were going to go out and do something on uh, the river, if I'm going to be training you in something, if you haven't been around me, you don't know what my capabilities are. So you may not have confidence in me as an instructor or a supervisor in teaching you boating or whatever that may be. So you're probably going to have a high number until you get used to, till you understand what I can teach you, what my capabilities are, right? Planning. Do we have a good plan? Crew selection. If we're responding to a swift water incident, do the people that I'm taking out on that response, do they have some training? Do they know uh, 
how to respond to swift water do they have do we have anybody in our crew that is at the ops level or technician level you know those are things that you will take into consideration when you do that assessment basically when you total all of those scores if it's 0 to 23 that's in the green area that's a low risk if it's 23 to 44 you're in the amber which means you want to be very very cautious if it's 44 to 60 then you're in the red area that's telling you that there are some very high risk associated with what you're doing and you may want to think about those things and see how many of those risks that you can mitigate and get that score lower a lot of the agencies this is something that is taught now through uh, the NASBLA boating classes and a lot of the agencies nationwide that have seen this have actually adopted it in their everyday uh, risk assessment uses when they respond so this is part of the national standard of that NASBLA boat training but I wish that I had had something like this that I could use before I retired when I was a commander I think that it would have helped me be a better commander where I could identify some risk maybe that I wouldn't have thought of. Pre-planning, one of the most important things that you can do is pre-plan. And what I mean by that is through your experience and through the history of responding to the calls that you've made here as far as swift water, <coughs> What areas normally flood in Jeffersonville? How many inches of rain does it take for that area to flood? How fast does that rain have to fall for that area to flood? You know, those are things that you will take into consideration over time and you can document so that when you get a forecast, you'll know what neighborhoods are going to flood. You'll know what roads will be impassable and that will help you pre-position personnel and equipment to those areas so that they're already there. If you get streets flooded and you can't get to them, if you pre-position them there based on your pre-planning, one of the most important things that you can do. And one of the things that uh, I noticed that's going to be difficult, I think, you know, it would be for me, is how the city of Jeffersonville has changed when, uh, with all the, the buildings along 62 with all of the parking lots. One of the best, one of the most prevalent ways of lowering the water level is how much water the, the soil can absorb. But when you build all those buildings and you have all of those huge parking areas, that water has to run off somewhere. So where is that water going? Do they have retention ponds that are those are those big enough to hold all that water? Or is that water going to go into areas that have never flooded before? Uh, so it may take a while for you to document exactly what all of this new construction, how that's going to affect you. And a couple of things we touched on it earlier, always have someone spotting upstream from you when you're doing a rescue or when you're doing an evacuation or whatever you don't want to get trapped by debris and always place secondary rescuers downstream with some kind of device that can help you exit the water most of you that have had the boating class have already had uh, a lot on uh, some of the PPE equipment but it's worth repeating that the national statistics, including Indiana, only 9% of the people will have PFDs on. And you notice from some of those pictures in that short video, a lot of the people there that were standing up on top didn't have a PFD on, not just the guy on the rappelling rope, but a lot of people standing up there where they were, the kayaks were taken off did not have a PFD on. It's great if you have funds where you can get all of that equipment for swift water response, but I can tell you it's very, very expensive. And the simple fact is that is earmarked for people that plan to get in the water. 
And I'm thinking probably that most of you are not planning on getting in the water. But there are certain things that are specific, uh, specifically developed or created for swift water response. Indiana is considered to be a cold water state. Cold water is defined as anything below 70 degrees. And as you'll see from that chart, the average temperature for the water in Indiana, in this part of the country, is somewhere in the mid-50s. That's the average. Of course, it's going to get warmer in the summer months, but the average temperature per year is in the mid-50s. And who can tell me the month when flooding is most prevalent in the state of Indiana? April, May, March, February. March. March. That's a cold water time. <coughs> now I know that all of you have been told, and it's correct, you can float in your turnout gear. You absolutely can under, under normal conditions. But when you respond to a swift water incident where you might get swept away with, with uh, swift water, you're going to be constantly moving which is going to push some of that air that is retained by your turnout gear that keeps you afloat, that your body movement is going to push some of that air out. So you want to make sure that you are dressed for success. You want to wear the apparel that's going to keep you alive under that circumstance because you're dealing with something that you normally don't have to deal with when you go to uh, swift water events and you want to be dressed for that type of event. <coughs> Example of what I'm talking about right there, uh, no PFD. If you watch the TV, the news segments during flooding, and I'm not picking on any side of the river, but I'm just using this because it's very prevalent. If you look uh, at the news when they have flooding in the Louisville area, you'll see people wading out into waist-deep water with no PFDs on. Moving water. Not just stationary water, but moving water. Very important that you match the gear that you're wearing with the job that you're trying to complete. Most of you have had this, I know, but a Type 1 PFD is an offshore. It's designed to keep an unconscious person uh, upright. A type 2 is the old horse collar. Type 3 is a flotation uh, aid. Has a little bit less flotation in it than the other two. Normally about 12 to 15 pounds of buoyancy. A type 4 is a throwable. Like the ring buoy on your boat. That can be very, very beneficial for a swift water rescue. It's good and solid. Uh, you can attach a line to it, a tag line, use it to move it out to uh, make a rescue. Type 5, most river rescue, swift water rescue vests are considered a type 5 because it's for a specific use. You never want to hard line someone without them having the capability of being able to disengage. Swift water vests have a belt around the waist with an O-ring in the back where they can do a disconnect. It's got a safety latch on the front where they can disconnect and the pressure of that line will pull the Velcro off and they can get themselves free. Never attach a line to somebody unless they have the capability of getting out of it because there's so much debris, so easy for them to get caught up, that line to get caught up in some kind of debris. They have to have a, a capability of freeing themselves. Okay. If you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember this, this section here on self-rescue, because this is how you will get yourself out of the water if you go in.
see how accidents happen? Several things in that video. You noticed that water looked like it was really booking, right? Yeah, it was getting But did you notice that that guy was able to catch up to the victim in the water? Not running. By just jogging, he wasn't running that fast? So that will give you an idea. We talked about the average flow being four miles an hour. It would not be uncommon whatsoever for swift water in this part of the country to reach that speed. It looks faster by looking at the water than it actually is, but 12 mile an hour exerts incredible pressure. Second thing, did you notice that one of the, the guy that was trying to rescue the rescuer went in the water also? Obviously, he was not planning on being in the water. He had on his turn, turnout gear, and he had on his vest. He had on a, a life jacket. Thank God. Uh, so it happens. People go in the water when they don't expect to. Third thing, throw bag. I heard, I heard the, uh, the uh, response when the guy made that chicken wing throw with the throw bag. Do you want to know why that worked? Because the water was the best. Well, Lighter surface. think about it. Most throw bags have lines that float. Okay, What did we talk about earlier? The surface of the water is the fastest flowing part. And the lower that you go, if you could, if you could chop that water, once you get below the surface, the farther you go down, that current slow the slower it goes so you've got a victim in the water I'm going to create more drag going through the water than this line is on the surface that's how that line caught up with the victim but what you want to do and I'll give you a little hint a throw bag is much easier to use if you dip it in the water and get it wet before you try to throw it We'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, what you want to do, you don't want to count on that line being able to catch up to that victim. You want to throw it past the victim, over his head, so that that line is going to drop right on top of him. And I can tell you, it's not as easy as it looks. We practiced a lot at that, and I can tell you, it takes a lot of practice. What causes first responders to go in the water? Normally, it's something that you can't see. We talked about that helical flow a while ago. If you're responding to somebody in swift water, you always want to keep in mind that that water is moving things as, it, as it's flowing downstream. How many times have, when you after we have severe flooding, how many times have you guys had to go to the boat ramp and wash off the boat ramp? Wash that silt off. That's coming from somewhere. What it's doing is it's moving that dirt. Very, very common for a scene like this to happen where that helical flow, that recirculating, revolving water along the shoreline is pulling the water out, but that surface is still intact until it gets to a certain point where it collapses or where you step on it when you're moving up to that shoreline to make to deploy a throw bag or to make a rescue to try to get somebody out and when your weight gets on there that gives way 
Very important that you remember that you take that into consideration. The force of moving water can do that very easily. That happens somewhere every year. And even if you're walking through a neighborhood to do an evacuation, to get people out of houses that can't get themselves out for whatever reason, the same way that a blind person uses a cane to try to find obstacles as they're walking, you want to use some kind of a probe when you're walking through that water because, quite frankly, you're walking blind. You can't see what's under that water. You can't tell if a sidewalk has been washed out. You can't tell if, the, if a culvert under the road. There's tremendous power of water going through culverts. You don't know if that's been washed out. So before you take a step, you want to use that probe to make sure that there is solid ground underneath where you're stepping or to make sure that there's not some kind of an obstacle in front of you. That flooded water, when it goes down, it hides a lot of things that can hurt you if you don't know what's there. And you guys will respond to countless events like that right there, where people drive in water and they end up stranded. So make sure that you take those precautions doesn't matter what it is. Anything that you can feel in front of you, whether it's a boat oar or a, a cane, doesn't matter what it is. Just something that you can make sure there's not an obstacle in front of you. <coughs> now, despite all that precaution, despite all that risk assessment that you've done, you still end up in the water. What are you going to do? Tell you what we've been going about an hour. Before we go to this, let's take 10. And then we'll, uh, we'll get into the meat and potatoes. Good. Okay, guys. You've taken all the precautions, but for some reason, accidents happen. We all know Murphy's Law. You're in the water. What do you do? I can tell you and... Uh, one of my uh, old compatriots has showed up. He can tell you the same thing. We responded to so many drownings, especially in uh, the lower pool at Falls of Ohio State Park where the water's pretty swift. One of the mistakes that people made almost continually when they went in the water is they tried to swim out at the point where they went in. They would fight that current and try to swim out where they went in. If you go in the water, what you want to do, first thing, is you want to look for the closest exit point where you can get out. And you have two options. The first option is don't fight the current because you won't win. You cannot swim against strong current. What you can do is turn around and swim with the current. Let that current help push you down and then swim to that exit point because you're using the current then instead of fighting it. If you don't immediately have that exit point, what you want to do is go into that survival float position. And that position is you want to lay on your back as flat as you can with your toes up out of the water. The reason you take your toes out of the water is because there are so many obstacles, so much debris in that water, you don't want to get yourself entrapped. If you let those legs dangle and they get entrapped, the pressure of that water, the energy and velocity of that water is going to flip you over and put you under. Okay, So you want to keep your toes out of the water, pointed downstream, and you're going the same way that we talked about in the boating class, setting that angle. Remember we talked about setting a ferry angle with that boat to make it go the direction that you want it to go? You can do the same thing with your body. That's a perfect position right there. Toes downstream, out of the water, and your head's up looking. What you want to do though is you don't let your bottom sag down 
because there are so much debris. Again, you don't want to be banging your bottom on, on uh, the debris that you're going to be going over. So try to lay as flat as you can. Now, what I'm going to do is, this is the same slide that we talked about with the boat operation. You're going to set a ferry angle. If the current is coming in this direction, what I'm going to do, if I'm this boat and I want to go in this direction, what I'm going to do is I'm going to angle my body like this, the same direction that boat is, and I'm going to backstroke. With my toes out of the water, I'm going to pull as much water and let that current push me broadside. The current is going to help me go in that direction. Does that make sense? The same way that it does your boat, when you set that ferry angle, it pushes you to that direction. All you have to remember is whatever direction you want to go, you want to turn your head in that direction and backstroke and let the current help you. If you, once you understand using the current to your advantage, I guarantee you, you can go down that East Race in South Bend where all that swift water training takes place. You can go down that East Race and eat a sandwich and maneuver your way around obstacles. Once you understand the dynamics of moving your body, setting the ferry angle, and moving that water that direction, once you do that, maneuvering in swift water is very easy. Any questions? Before we talk about strainers, uh, my old partner here was involved in an incident, if he wants to talk about it. Would you like to share that with him? Yeah, I'd go. Sure. Come on up here. Didn't talk, but um, everything that he's teaching you. Well, first off, my name's Mac Spanauer. I know a bunch of you. Um, retired CEO with him. Retired the same day. Um, but anyway, I, I get what I. I'll tell you the story. He's right. Down at the falls, I worked a drowning one time, and I remember a, a guy fell in, and his fiance was standing there. She's looking right at him. And the first thing he did was when he came up. This is her words. And, her, her, and his brother was standing there, was trying to swim right back to her. And he was there where the white water was shooting down. And uh, he was a Navy man, you know, so he'd been around water, I assume. Tried to swim, he looked her right in the eyes, like I'm looking at Rusty, and says, you know, it screams at her, and that current starts taking her, or taking him. And there was a fisherman standing there, one of those old guys we call river rats. It's not derogatory, that's just what we are when we're on the river. And he was standing there, and she turns and yells at him and says, get him, help him, help him. And he looked back, the guy's head's still up, and he said, honey, he's gone. And his head was still up. He, he fought that current the whole time until the water won. And then he drowned, we found him just several days later. So I have all those visions in my head, and then all of a sudden I'm working the drowning, or the uh, floods of 2008, if y'all remember those. Um, pretty bad. We were up in Columbus and we worked all night long and then the next day we, we slept a little bit and then we went back to work again. And about midnight we had a 911 call. Ended up being a computer malfunction, believe it or not. We take the airboat out, it's 12.30 at night, and we locate the house. Uh, everything checks out okay. Went over and checked on a retired conservation officer's house. There, All those houses were like islands out here and this was in northern Jackson County above Seymour, Brownstown stuff. And uh, so as we're coming back, I remember on the way out, I said, how far are we going? He said, I don't know, a couple miles. Ask a lot of questions, even if it's to yourself. And I thought, a couple miles, okay. Well, what's out here? And he said, a lot of uh, fields, crop fields. And I remember, and I don't have any reason why I asked it, but I said, are there any fences? And he said, no, this is all crops. So there's no pasture ground with fences or anything. I was like, oh, okay. And it was pretty cool. It's the first time I've been on a, an airboat. Last time I've been on an airboat won't go back. Uh, it's not so funny when it's down there. Look, down in Florida it looks all cooked fun, but here it wasn't. So uh, I'm sitting up high. Any of you get a chance to be on an airboat, you're up high. The big motor's behind you and the big three blades are behind you too. Three three rows of blades. And uh, to me that looks like a blender. Looks like, it looks like you go through it and you're going to be spit out. So uh, I was sitting on there 
and we went up about two miles from White River. And White River, you know how the rivers are. Everything along the rivers is tree line. So you got the main current. Well, when everything's flooded, we're two miles out. It's gonna suck you to that river. So anyway, we come out of there and he looks at me. He got earmuffs on and I, I looked at him and he motioned something. He goosed it and the, uh, the big airboat swung around. When it did, it come around like this and a lot of water stuff coming on the starboard side just started rolling in. And I was looking at it thinking, these things are you know, indestructible, right? They're supposed to sit on top of water. Uh, and then as it as that water was coming, I could tell this wasn't going. It wasn't going to re, It wasn't going to get right. And I thought, holy oh, shit! And uh, as it rolled, as it started to roll, I thought, well, I got to clear him. So I jumped, and then I'm worried about those blades because I thought, oh man, I'm gonna get down here. And you know how guys and you all emergency responders and and do great what you do. Um, and if you get in a situation, sometimes it just slow. It's like slow motion, but your life's flying ahead of you. But it's, it's the situation. And as I went under, I came up, and when I came up, I saw the boat go like this, and you hear them bro where they're ramming those uh, blades in the water now. And uh, so the current's taking me. It's midnight, dark, and I, I look up. I come up, and I. I probably was from me, Rusty from the boat. And my partner, he was a six foot five guy, young guy, young guy at the, uh, at the time. And um, his head come up. And it's like the boat's right here and his head's right here. And I'm looking at him. And he goes, Mac. He goes, I'm hung. I'm hung. And, and the, the water's taking me. Uh, and he said he was hung on the boat. And I, so my instinct, like your all's, is to save lives right we're, that's what we're in the business to do we, we try to save everybody else we, we always forget about ourselves sometimes and so we're going to save them and then of course when it's one of your own you're really going at it so what i did was what that guy did first thing i did was put my head down because i've always been in control of the situation never not been in control and i put my head down swam real hard and expecting to be there to help him be the be the guy you know save my partner and i come up and I was further than from me in the wall, a lot further. And he said, I'm hung on the boat. And the next thing I know, I saw as the boat settled, I saw his head just go under. And I thought, oh my God. And I tried again. I thought I can do it. I tried again. This time when I was swimming, I, I, I grabbed, I hit something. I had my life jacket and everything on, right? I grabbed something underneath the water. This will prove to you about what he was talking about, what about the fence. And I don't know what it was, but it was pretty, I got it. I don't know how I got it, but I grabbed it and I thought, oh, I hold on. Well, I held on. And what do you think the current did? It just pushed me right down to it. So I'm like, this, this is not working, you know? So I let, pop, I let it go and, and it brought me back up. And I tried again. And then I thought, man, I lost my partner. And so then your focus your switches to survival. And uh, so I, the training kicked in because I've been to the Swift Water Rescue back in 1986, somewhere around there, 87. Somewhere. And um, but it kicked in, and so I, I rode over and then I heard him yell, "Mac!" And I could turn around and in the silhouette, it looked like he was either on the boat or I was seeing the the props up on you know the bottom side up. I don't know. Number one rule for us was not to leave your boat, and. Uh, you know, stay back and they'll rescue you there. And as I'm going down, he said, swim back to me. I hollered back, I can't. I've tried. So I rolled over and got into that mode, got my feet up. And I, I remember coming up and I was looking and I saw a tree over here about, about like that. I thought I could swim to it because I saw it way down here. So I roll over, I swim, and I look. And where the hell is this, this, this tree? And there it goes. Of course, it's me going. It's there. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to get something within a couple, you know, six feet real close. And uh, anyway, I I rode over, and this is where, you know, you got to be, I, I thought, you know, all my family, all my friends know how I feel about them. Uh, tried to be good, as good as I can. You know, not perfect by any stretch of anything. I thought, well, I'm okay to die. Because I really thought, I'm a realist. So I thought, there maybe you got 25% chance here. You know, because two miles you're going to get to that river, and what am I going to hit before I get the main stem of the river? Is all those trees, and then I'm 
I'm hosed. I'm going to be in bad shape if I get to that point. So I ended up rolling over and I started tethering and looking for things. And we had passed an island that there was a, a coyote on it. And I thought, I don't give a crap if I live, lay up there. I'll share the island with the coyote. <laughs> <laughs> I had all my gun belt on. I wouldn't even shot her. Uh, uh, I was, she stayed on that end of the island. And me at this end, I'd have, I'd have shared it. Been glad to share it. I never saw it. Um, and then all of a sudden, I'm sitting here trying to survive. And I hear a splash, splash. And I turn around. And my partner left his boat and swam down. And uh, I thought, well, now this is great. There, there ain't gonna be anybody telling them where I can find my body. You know, I'm like, it is now we're gonna die together. And uh, so I was like, "What are you doing?" Of course, an older officer, younger guy. I'm like, "What are you doing? You're supposed to stay with the boat." He said, "I heard your voice. I came to the last spot. I heard your voice and in that direction." And um, ended up, he grabbed me and he was operating the boat. So uh, he, uh, I guess, felt guilty. You know, he's like, "Oh man, I'm sorry. You got kids and all this." And I'm like, "Shut up." Let's just figure out a way out of here right now. And uh, so uh, we hit a little high spot in the ground and our feet hit. And I, I could dig my feet in and push back and, the, and it was on that little hump, took away some of that current, I guess. And I said, uh, Nate was his name, Nate Barry. I said, Nate, man, uh, I, I feel the ground. He goes, I know, I've been standing on it. He, held me a little bit up and with my vest I didn't want I'm shorter than him so I was like well let me go and so we got in there and that water was like this well now I reached out my gun belt your equipment's big I don't know how you guys do it with all that stuff you wear but uh, I pulled out a sure light and uh, I said well, it works I pulled out my radio first I mean drenched and I tried to radio and then he radioed and it worked I, I like Motorola and it, and it worked uh, and uh, couldn't believe that. I was like, holy cow, put that back. And uh, the guy that we came to check on, he came out of, of his house. We could barely see him, looked like an ant. And I, we had, uh, he's 6'5", so I gave him my light and he's flashing it. And that guy had an airboat, believe it or not. And uh, <laughs> it could have been just a normal boat. Uh, but uh, he brought, he, he fired it up. He, he actually walked in and we yelled, and, but we're like probably half a mile. And anyway, he went back in, he came back out, got the boat, brought it over to us, got 20 yards from us, killed it because he can't talk, communicate, cut the engine, and where does the boat go? I'm like, what are you turning it off for? Don't turn off a boat. Uh, and then he started back up and came to us. I got on the side of the boat and went to get my leg up there and my toes were trying to hold on like a raccoon's paw, man. I was like, come on, get me up here. <laughs> and uh, finally, we, uh, the other guy went over, belly walked into it, reached over, grabbed me, and pulled me up. And that guy saved our life. And, um, and, and most, a lot of things that happened from that, you know. And I was like, man, I appreciate it. But why would you walk out and go back in? He goes, I forgot my cigarettes. I'm like, <laughs> 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 life ain't in the balance, man. You got to get your cigarettes. I'm like, okay, whatever, as long as you got here. Uh, great guy, they gave him an award. But anyway, the, the moral to that whole story is that um, your, your toes up. <laughs> Stay away from the airboats. Uh, um, is to get your butt up, because I'm telling you, you don't want any anything that that, that, that dragon can catch you. So. It's uh, anyway. That was my story, and that wasn't. It. I wasn't playing here. To tell, I'm talking about this, but I wanted to see Felix, just see how he was instructing and stuff like that. But appreciate you guys letting me do it. I'm telling that story. It's uh, it's kind of weird. So appreciate it very much. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that, Mac. You know, the bottom line is, guys, it can happen to anybody. You know been to the best river rescue school had all of the boating experience it happens whether you intend it to or not it can happen and it's critically important that if you go in the water first thing you want to do is don't panic you know keep a clear head and understand I got to work with the water I can't beat it if I try to fight it it's going to win so how do I work with it use that current to your advantage now, we talked a little bit earlier about a strainer. I guarantee you if he had got to the main stem of that river, he would have hit a strainer somewhere. We talked about how deadly they can be 
And remember, a strainer is anything that will let water pass through it, but not a solid object. Any solid object, it will trap it. Now, first thing you want to do is if you go in the water, it doesn't matter if you are in a boat or if you are survival floating. If there is any way that you can avoid that strainer, avoid it. If you can't and you see that you're going to go into that strainer despite your best efforts, what you want to do before you get there you flip out of that position on your back and you swim downstream with the current toward that strainer. Your best Michael Phelps impression, you swim like your life depends on it, because it does. And as you get to that strainer, you reach as high as you can while you're still kicking to propel yourself as far up on that strainer as you can get. You want to go over it or you want to at least end up on top of it. But do not try to go into that strainer feet first because what will happen is the same thing that he will to told you. The force of that water, we talked about how much energy that moving water has. If you don't get your body up as high as you can get it, it's going to pin you against it. And it doesn't matter if you're in a boat, then it will pin that boat against that strainer. So just remember, you flip around and you swim as hard as you can possibly swim and reach up as high as you can to go over that strainer while you're still kicking. Do it in one motion with all the momentum that you can possibly muster. Because if you go into it feet first, something like this is going to happen. Any questions about that? Okay. Something we've already talked about, the majority of flooding in Indiana is going to be during what month? March. March, absolutely. And during March, what do we have? Cold water, right? Cold water is going to limit the amount of time that you have to rescue yourself. If you go into cold water, I mean cold water, the first thing that you're going to experience is pain. Because cold water hurts. The next thing that you're going to experience as you go into that water, just like this guy, see his face there? What you end up doing, it's, uh, it's called a torso reflex. First thing you're going to do when that cold water hits you is you're going to gasp for air. You're going <gasps> to... What happens at that point is a lot of times you will aspirate water. So it's very difficult to not panic, but when you panic, your respiration rate increases. You want to control your breathing. You want to control that panic because when you're panicked, do you think as clearly as you do when, when you're calm? You want to be in charge of all your faculties. So. You know, we're in the business of doing things that are hazardous. So try to relax because you want to be able to concentrate on getting yourself out of the water. Kind of a guideline, water temperature and how that's going to affect you. Now, you notice that 40 to 50 degree water, water Exhaustion or unconsciousness is from 30 to 60 minutes. But what that doesn't reflect is long before that, you're going to start losing control of your fine motor skills, your fingers. You're not going to be able to zip a life jacket if you don't have one on. You're going to lose control of those muscle groups and your dexterity long before you get unconscious. So. You want to get yourself out of the water as quickly as you can. Water, especially cold moving water, will conduct heat away from your body 25 times faster than air of the same temperature. 
25 times faster. So the sooner you can get out of that water, the better your chance of surviving that event. You want to, if you are in a position where you can get into an eddy, if you can't exit the water, then you want to find as safe an area as you can find, which we talked about earlier. Get into that eddy. That eddy is a, an area where you can rest, wait for somebody to come and rescue you. If you got your PFD on and you can get into that eddy, then you can protect some of those high heat loss areas, such as your sides, your groin, your neck. You can get into those positions, but you can't do it if you're fighting that current. First thing you want to do is exit the water if you can. Next, if you can't exit the water, find that safe area where you can maintain as much of your body heat as you can. Now, some of the things that you can do from shore without getting in the water to rescue someone else. The normal sequence, and you want to do this from the lowest risk to the highest risk. You don't want to start out at number 10 if number one or number two is going to work. But basically, talk, reach, throw, row, and go. Some areas like uh, uh, on Lake Michigan, you know, they have the option of calling the Coast Guard because there's a lot of air stations, you know, on the Great Lakes. They can actually call a Coast Guard to send a rescue helicopter. We don't have that option here. So that's kind of off the table for us. But the first thing you want to do is simply try to talk to that victim. You know, if, if he's on a vehicle and there is some way you can get an object to him, a line or whatever, a skiff hook, you know, let him self-rescue. The next thing is if you have a solid object that you can do an indirect, indirect rescue with, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. Anything that you can reach him with, whether it's a ladder off your truck, a skiff hook, anything that you can reach him with, you want to use that. Next thing, that has saved more lives in swift water rescue than any other device. A simple rope in a bag. A row rescue, any kind of boat rescue. I know you guys just got your Zodiac. I think that's probably going to be very, very beneficial to you uh, when you have flooding in this area. Uh, really, really good response boats. You're lucky, uh, you're lucky to have that in your arsenal. Again, Hilo, not really an option for us. That's something that our folks, uh, or my old agency, up on Lake Michigan, that's actually Lake Michigan right there, and uh, they do train with the Coast Guard to do hoisting off boats where they do rescues, but unfortunately that's not an option for us down here. And again, throw bags. One of the most important pieces of equipment that you can have is no more sophisticated than this. Basically you want a bag with probably, I think this has got 75 feet of line in it, but the line floats just like you saw in the video where the line floated and caught up to the victim. Did we talk about why it caught up? The drag and the, the flotation? Okay, very good. One thing I would encourage you guys to do is practice with these throw bags because I promise you it's not as easy as it looks. Uh, and I'll give you a hint, it's much easier to throw them accurately if you get them wet before you try to throw it. It gives it a little more heft, a little more weight, and uh, a lot easier to throw accurate. You want to talk to that victim. If he is within earshot of you, tell him what you're going to do because you guys are first responders. You're trained to do rescues, so it's a lot easier for you to stay calm than it's going to be for that civilian that sees his life rushing before him. So be very verbal with him. You may have to repeat yourself three or four times before he comprehends what you're saying, but talk him through what you want him to do. 
if you miss, if you throw this bag and you miss, you don't want to try to take the time to wad that line back in there and throw it again. What you're going to do if you miss, I'm going to pull that line in and I'm going to loop it. And I'm going to hold those loops in my hand just like this until I get everything back. Then I'm going to transfer about three or four loops and I'm going to hold that bag and I'm going to throw it and let go of all those loops except the end of my line to make my second throw. Okay? Because I can do that much faster than I can wad it back into that bag. Okay? So just grab it. Hold that in your hands where you won't let go. Then I just loop it over the end of my fingers. Then when you get uh, to the end of the rope, give yourself about three loops in this hand, throw and let go. That's much faster to make a second attempt than trying to wad it back in that bag. Some other options. If you are able to get to that victim with some kind of a tagline or your throw bag, you kind of saw it in the video where uh, they were rescuing the guy in Los Angeles. What you want to tell that victim once you get that bag to him is put that line over the opposite shoulder. If I'm going to this shore over here, then I w the victim needs to have that on his left shoulder. Okay? Now, pendulum, the way that works, again, we're going to use the current to our advantage. If I'm standing on river right, remember, that's from the perspective of looking downstream, correct? If I'm standing on river right and I throw that to the victim and I hold that line, the current is going to just pendulum that victim over to the shore that I'm on. The current is going to push him over there. And if he has that line on his left shoulder, it's going to get him closer to the shore where I can reach out and grab him than if he has it on this shoulder. Does that make sense? That's referred to as the pendulum. Tagline is simply putting a line across that waterway where a victim, when he goes underneath it, can grab a hold of it. Uh, a lot of agencies already have uh, taglines pre-rigged with cargo nets because it's much easier for a victim to grab that cargo net when he goes under, underneath than just the line itself. So they already have them pre-rigged, but that's an example of a tagline. We talked earlier about keeping those feet out of the water because of all the obstacles. If you find somebody that's entrapped, that current is going to push them under the water. So what you have to do with a stabilization line is you got to rig that line where you can pull his upper torso up out of the water goes underneath his arms and what you're doing is you're counteracting that current by having that line in a V you can see we talked about the water piling up on the upstream side of a obstacle in the water well if you are in the water then you are an obstacle in the water see how that's starting to pile up That is a way that you can keep that victim's head out of the water so he can breathe until you are able to make a rescue. And I'll give you a hint. If you go in the water and somebody rescues you, throws you a line, and you're doing a pendulum, or you're on the end of a tag line or a zip line, if that water starts to run over your head, what you want to do is tuck your chin because that's going to create a flow here where you can still breathe with that water going over your head. Does that make sense? What you're going to do is kind of tuck your chin because the force of that water will go over your head. But if you tuck that chin and create kind of an air pocket right there, you are still able to get little breaths as that water is going over. Make sense? 
Okay, we talked about this earlier. Never tie, never hard line a line to a victim or even a rescuer unless he has one of the quick release vests. And my understanding, the, the story that Mac told you about what happened to him, I think the guy that was trapped actually got the strap on his vest caught on the uh, steering lever for that airboat. And I think the way he got loose was able to disengage that quick release buckle, and that's how he got a loose. It's just about his uh, vest, and he fought it because the boat shoved him down, the boat and the vest is bringing him up, but the stick is down. He couldn't get it off. So luckily, we had these good vests that have a quick release and don't need to save him. And that stick shift was all bent while you're painting him down there, bending it. Yep. Yep. Without having that quick release, that type of vest specifically for swift water you never know but he very well may have not survived that entrapment a zip line if you need to get from one side to the other or if you get trapped and you end up in the middle of a flooded area where there's swift water all around you and you need to get from from uh, one side to the other you'll set a zip line up at a 45 degree angle and again you're just going to hold on to a line with a carabiner on it and let that current take you to the lower end of that 45 degree okay you're not using any of your swimming skill the current is going to move you in a battle against that water guys we will always lose use the current and the strength and energy of that water to your advantage Something that I'm sure Matt can uh, also tell you is when you're working around moving water, especially around a low head dam or some kind of a hydraulic where water's dropping over an object, the noise that that water makes, you're not going to be able to communicate with a radio because it's going to be so loud. I would encourage you to develop, you may already have them, I don't know, but I would think about developing some hand signals. That's one of the things that they taught us when we went through the school. And you really need them because the noise around those low head dams is deafening. Create some very basic hand signals that you can use with each other that you will understand. Uh, I think this one, are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. I think that's kind of universal. Even military teams use that to prevent uh, making noise. Uh, when they're on some kind of an operation. You know what we talk? When you respond, guys, always have a plan. Always have a plan that you've considered all the risk, that you're aware of all the risk, and you've tried to mitigate as many of those risks as you can. Try the best that you can not to go into any situation blind. Even if you have to alter that plan a little bit, at least you have a base to start with. Risk versus gain. We talked about the uh, Coast Guard. You know, uh, it's a difficult thing because we all want to save people. But you will encounter times where the risk is just, the gain is not worth the risk. If you already have someone that's deceased that's in the recirculation of a low head dam, if they're already deceased, the last thing you want to do is lose rescuers trying to get them out. Because it will, they will eventually come out. Uh, you know, sometimes you, that's what our training does for us. Always consider risk versus gain. This line, when I would get it wet, always dry it before you store it. Don't just wad it back in the bag. Because this, as simple as it is, it may be the difference in making a rescue or not being able to make one. So when you're working in a water environment, whether it be on a boat or whether you're making swift water rescue responses, lines are incredibly important. 
Never wrap that line around your hand because we talked about all the debris that's being swept off the shorelines. You wrap that around your hand and it gets caught on something like a tree that's going downstream underwater. You can't see it. Uh, you're either going to have to get that off your hand very quickly or you're going in after it. Last module, guys, we're going to talk about low head dams. Uh, again, they are very prevalent in uh, Clark County. Not just Clark County, but they're very prevalent in Indiana statewide. One of my early responses when I was a district lieutenant, our Swift Water Rescue Team was practicing at Williams Dam. That's just west of Bedford. And I was at home, it was in the evening. They were training there during high water. And I just got a call that two of our team members went in the water and a team member went after them and was non-responsive. So I get up there and the guy was a personal friend of mine and Max, name was Carl Kelly. And the situation there at this low head dam was they had been training and they were doing a, a a rescue technique called a two-boat tether and two of our people actually ended up in the water inside the boil and they were being recirculated like those guys in the video that you saw. They tried some rescue techniques that didn't work and I'll explain that when we get into it what some of the issues were. And he took it upon himself, he took his boat, he was in a zodiac, he took it across the boil to try to get them out he got caught in the boil and to give you an idea of what the force of the water coming over a low head dam is that water took him into the face of the dam and it disintegrated the boat he started getting recirculated they were able to get the first two out but he didn't make it and he died uh, a very good friend of both mine and Max but four parts to a low head dam the face, the backflow, the boil line, and the outflow. Basically, like we talked about earlier, it doesn't have to be a low head dam to generate that dynamic of a hydraulic. It can be any kind of a rock where water is flowing over it and going down. Or in your circumstance, it can be a city street where you've got water flowing over a street and dropping down on the opposite side. Anytime you have a volume of water going over a higher area to a lower area, it can create a hydraulic. Basically what happens, water coming over, this is considered the face of the dam right here. This is the backwash. The boil line is right through here, and this is the outwash. Got a better picture right here. You can see the boil line. Looks like water's boiling, right? Popping up. On this side, the dam side of that boil line, all of this current is going back this direction because the power of that water dropping over the face of that dam or that object, it's coming over with such force that it's going all the way to the bottom, going out, and then it's coming back to the surface. That's causing that recirculation in this area, but on the other side of this boil line, the current's going downstream. One of the things that they taught us is you can do a swimming exit if you are able to swim along the bottom and pass that boil line and come up on the downstream side. I can tell you I would hate to try to do that. That would be, uh, you know, I'm sure there's probably better swimmers than me in here, but I would sure hate to have to rely on that technique. Hmm? Yep. Yep. Dry yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You all probably see that at Blackston Mill, don't you? Yeah. The, what dam, when that get, water gets up, you'll see this every time there. 
Yeah. Just remember, guys, never, this line right here, even if you're in a boat, do not cross that line. Do not cross that line because you get sucked in to the current. It's hard to tell in a photograph, but from this point to this point, all of that current, all of the velocity of that water is pushing you into the dam. To give you an idea of the energy created by this, when the officer that we were just talking about crossed that boil line to make that rescue, this current grabbed his boat, his Zodiac, it was a rigid hull Zodiac, and pushed it in to that overflow there. It disintegrated that boat. You literally, it's on film. There were people videoing the, the exercise. It literally disintegrated that boat because of the force of that water. Threw him out and he recirculated several times. And when a dead cow. Huh? Next to a dead cow. Yeah. And one of the things that I told you when we started is that you know, old guys like me, we've made about every mistake that we can make. And one of my goals is if I can keep you from making mistakes that I made by telling you what happened, then I'm all for it. The day that happened, there was a series, I think, of mis miscalculations that, that took place that caused that. They were doing a rescue technique at this low head dam called a two boat tether. And basically what that is, is you have two boats that are connected by a line. The lead rescue boat comes up, is supposed to stay on this side of the boil line in the outflow, and then use a rope bag to throw to a victim that's recirculating. There's a line going to a secondary vessel that is supposed to keep that rescue boat from crossing the boil line. Now what's supposed to happen if that rescue boat gets too close this secondary boat is supposed to do a maneuver called a peel out. And basically what that means is when you're in a John boat and you turn that tiller as far as you can you gas it and you spin the back end of that boat around which is going to pull that boat back toward you. Does that make sense? When the rescue boat crossed that boil line, the secondary boat simply did not have the power because of the energy of that water. It could not pull it back across the boil line. Didn't have enough horsepower. One mistake. You know, always consider that in your risk assessment. Do I have enough boat to accomplish what I want to accomplish? Secondary, uh, there's a backup plan in case that happens. And that backup plan is to swamp that second boat. And basically, you're using it like a sea anchor. You ever see, you know what a sea anchor is? It's like a, it's like a parachute that you throw it in the current. And it in the water inflates that like a parachute, <clears throat> like you do uh, in the air. It will deploy that sea anchor and the current going downstream will then pull those boats out. So the concept is the same. You're supposed to swamp that secondary boat, meaning get all your weight on one side, let water come in, and then that extra weight of that boat being swamped is going to pull that primary boat back. Well, they were in a boat called a Rescue One boat. It's made where you can't swamp it. So, wrong equipment for the wrong task. Okay, like I said, normally in a tragedy, you can go back and you can see little things that should have been done different or could have been done different. You can't blame somebody because it's, it's a training scenario, but those are the kinds of things that you have to learn from. So, anyway, that, that drives home my point about situational awareness and risk assessment. 
always, always try to consider as much as you can. Now, if you have a victim trapped in the boil, if you can get a line across that waterway, which most of the areas in Clark County, it would be relatively easy to get a line all the way across where the lowhead dams are located. If you can use a ring buoy like you have on your boat, attach a line to each side, work that back and forth in that backflow to get it to that victim so he can grab a hold of it. You want to work that victim from one side or the other. Don't try to pull him across that boil line. It's going to be much easier for him to hold on if you're pulling him sideways than it is if you're trying to pull him against all that current. Make sense? Some other techniques, uh, again we've talked about throw bags, the importance of having those. Skiff hooks, anything that you can reach a victim with to do an indirect rescue. But a lot of agencies, like yours, uh, they're using fire hose where they can cap them and inflate them. They're using them for ice rescues, they're using them for rescues at low head dams. You know, I don't know if that's something that you have the capability of. I know a lot of uh, agencies, the, the training that we got originated in the state of Ohio because they were having so many fatalities at low head dams. And I know a lot of the, the fire departments in Ohio have developed that program where they use inflatable fire hose. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody in Indiana is doing that or not. But if you have that capability, it's a great, uh, a great tool to put in your tool belt. You know, we always want Indiana to be first in something. Uh, you notice that it's one of the red states, and that's because Indiana is one of the leaders in deaths associated with low head dams. It's one of the leaders in the nation. That's a statistic that we really don't want. Why? And, huh? Why did Indiana have so many? Uh, flood control is what they're supposed to uh, originally created for. Flood control where they can slow flow down from one area to another. Uh, there are tons of them, I can tell you, up north. And honestly, I don't know if they were created for uh, irrigating, irrigating those big fields up there you know, uh, to keep the water level at a certain point. But honestly, I don't know. I can tell you that there is a lawsuit right now against the state of Indiana over a fatality from a canoeist or a kayaker. I'm thinking it was in Hamilton County. They went over Lowhead Dam, drowned. The family is suing the state because they're saying that there should be signage upstream from every Lowhead Dam in the state. But the problem is, a lot of these are on waterways that are not classified as navigable, which, meaning, which means they're actually private property. So the state is saying that we don't have the burden of marking private property. So honestly, I don't know how that's gonna, going to uh, end up. Don't we have nine in Clark County? There's a bunch. We have at least nine low waterhead dams in Clark County. Any right here close that you know of? Well, yeah. Um, Let's see, 14 Mile Creek. 14 Mile Creek up by me, uh, yeah. up off Marion Martin Road. Well, just in Jeffersonville. In Jeffersonville, you got... Um, I don't know about Jeffersonville. I don't think there's any right in town. But the more you guys... got three. Yeah. But the chances of you getting called to help somebody else, especially since you've got a Zodiac boat... Pretty reasonable. Yeah, I would say pretty reasonable. But keep in mind, for the dynamic of this kind of recirculation, it doesn't have to be a low head dam. Any place where you're gonna have water dropping over to a lower area can create that recirculation. And the results is gonna be the same. There's gonna be a boil line and there's gonna be recirculating water, just like you saw in the kayak video where the water was dropping over that uh, small waterfall. But as you might expect, 
the, the age group and gender where that's affected most by this are beer drinking, uh, dare taking teenage boys. And this kind of blew me away with all of the, with all of the, uh, with all the public service announcements and all of the safety training. The number of deaths associated with low head dams has went up dramatically recently. And what you can tell here is basically for every three people that go into the recirculation of a low head dam, almost about two are going to end up dead. This is something that we did uh, that you might consider as part of your pre-planning. What we did for, it doesn't have to, we did it for low head dams across the state, but this is something that you can use for any hazard that you identify within the city of Jeffersonville. What we tried to do is take GPS coordinates and we took photographs of low water when we could see the actual obstructions on the bottom. Then we took pictures of normal pool and then we took pictures of flood stage so that if we had to do a response there, we could pull those up and actually see what we were dealing with under the water you know, made our response a lot safer, gave us an idea of how to plan how we were going to make a rescue or a response uh, because we had that documentation in advance. That is around somewhere. I don't know who has it. Uh, might be able to get our hands on that for you. I don't know. Okay. But anyway. I'll get it, I'll get it out you we're bypassing those, uh, those quizzes. But anyway, do you have any questions, guys? Uh, I'm always around. Uh, you know, us old-timers, we've made a lot of mistakes, and if there's anything that, that 